I have the great pleasure to introduce the next speaker. So what we are going to do is that we will have three sessions, three talks right after each other. The first speaker of the session is Dr. Shadi Salashur. <coughs> she is a senior technical leader at Gas Technology Institute, GTI Energy. This is the institute that had a report on underground hydrogen storage in 79. Yeah, that's the same institute in Chicago. Providing technical leadership and project management for a range of R&D projects focused on advancing low carbon energy solutions. By the way, proudly, we have 50% experts females in this hydrogen workshop, and we are really proud. And a lot of females just saying leaders, leaders, and that's, this is really, we are really proud of this, this diversity we have. She currently leads and manages uh, federally and privately funded projects investigating subsurface technologies for large scale hydrogen storage in porous media. Shadi holds a PhD in petroleum engineering, minoring in data science and anal analytics from the University of Oklahoma, and is dedicated to collaborating with cross functional teams to develop and implement cutting edge solutions to address key challenges in the energy landscape. She actively participates in the American Gas Association's Underground Storage Committee and serves as an officer on the R&D Committee for the Society for Petroleum Engineers. Her expertise encompasses uh, conducting data-driven research and analysis, advancing the development of subsurface energy storage and production solutions, and enhancing the utilization of big data analytics to facilitate optimized design, development, and field development of emerging technologies. So we had her talk scheduled for yesterday, but she got stuck in Chicago airport because of 4th of July, high travel traffics. Now we have the pleasure to have her today with us. So we are very much looking forward to hearing your lecture. Thanks for the introduction, Hadi. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I definitely have the feeling that I'm surrounded by smart people, which is great. And the topic of this talk, as you can see, is uh, hydrogen leak detection and monitoring, but that's not the only topic I'm going to talk about. When I was preparing the presentation, I felt like uh, there are so many other exciting projects that I would like to talk about, so I will go over um, some of our projects very quickly. First, I want to uh, start by introducing uh, GTI Energy, who we are, what we do. Uh, and then I will highlight a couple of our research projects um, in the area of hydrogen, more specifically one around the hydrogen, underground storage of hydrogen, uh, and one around the, uh, the utilization of digital technologies, more specifically digital twins, uh, for facilitating hydrogen leak detection. Uh, as Hadi mentioned, uh, GTI Energy was previously known as a Gas Technology Institute. We went through a rebranding uh, about a over about a little over a year ago, uh, but uh, basically GTI Energy, uh, GTI Gas Technology Institute, Institute of Gas Technology, they are all the same. And as Hadi mentioned, um, we were in the space of hydrogen uh, research and hydrogen underground storage uh, in 1970s. And of course it wasn't me, it was my <laughs> colleagues. Um, so we are an independent research and development organization. Uh, we were established by the natural gas industry over 80 years ago. And uh, in terms of the uh, re research scope, we are working on developing solutions for a broad range of industry challenges, really all the way from the downhole to the burner tip. And we do that by running different uh, collaborati uh, collaborative um, research programs. Some of them are highlighted here, OTD, UTD, ETF, and LCRI. I'm going to highlight a couple of these programs, um, mainly because uh, they are the main uh, sponsors of uh, the research projects I'm going to highlight today. So LCRI, or Low Carbon Resources Initiative, it's a uh, five-year R&D program um, that was established in two, uh, 2020, and it's basically jointly uh, led by GTI uh, and the uh, EPRI Electric Power Research Institute. And it's basically a program that's focused on developing and advancing uh, low carbon um, technologies for integrating more renewable, more low carbon fuel into our existing infrastructure and planning out developing new infrastructure for uh, accelerating the use of low carbon fuels. 
Uh, in terms of the uh, molecules, uh, the program is looking at hydrogen, ammonia, uh, synthetic fuels, as well as biofuels. And in terms of the scope, it expands across the value chain, all the way from producing these molecules to storing, transporting, and uh, end using in different applications, including commercial, residential, industrial, and power applications. And um, another important piece of this program is the integration, how the, all of these can be integrated into uh, one energy system that meets uh, the demand in, um, um, in an affordable way, way for, for the customers. Uh, we have over 50 industry sponsors. Uh, they are mostly um, gas and electric utilities with uh, over $100 million in funding. Uh, another collaborative program that we have is Operation Technology Development. Uh, it's basically um, an independent member-controlled entity that we established in early 2000. Uh, the members are mainly the uh, gas utility companies, and uh, basically they come together every year dedicating funding uh, and discussing what challenges they are facing as operators in the industry and uh, um, establishing a guideline for us about what um, technologies we need to be working on. And um, in 2020, we also established Hydrogen Technology Center. At Hydrogen Technology Center, we are looking at you know, establishing and testing technologies across the hydrogen value chain, again, all the way from sourcing and making uh, to moving, storing, and eventually using it for different uh, applications. And for that, we have a range of projects. Uh, some of them are more uh, large-scale demonstration projects uh, around um, utilization of hydrogen, production of hydrogen, but we also uh, have um, um, early stage uh, research and development projects, such as the one on uh, underground hydrogen storage. So with that, uh, I can move on to the favorite topic for myself and probably for a lot of you, underground storage of hydrogen. Uh, the first project we completed was under LCRI, and the main scope of this project based was basically to look at uh, potential pathways for retrofitting our existing natural gas storage facilities for the hydrogen service. And uh, this was the project that was really uh, dictated uh, by our uh, members, because most of them are gas utility companies. They are owners of the uh, natural gas uh, storage facilities, and they wanted to know uh, if they want to commit to their uh, you know, hydrogen strategy, uh, how they can utilize their existing uh, infrastructure. Um, so a big part of this project was basically to engage those uh, industry partners, receive their feedback, uh, and uh, for kind of send them a formalized survey so they can tell us uh, what issues and challenges they have in their mind um, so we can uh, kind of come up with the right questions for our um, uh, future research portfolio. Uh, in this project, basically what we heard from most of them uh, was uh, most of these underground gas storage reservoirs in the U.S. are more than six, seven decades old. And um, even storing natural gas in these uh, facilities is challenging, let alone introducing hydrogen. So a lot of the research effort has to be focused on the material compatibility, upgrading of the infrastructure, um, and uh, ba basically um, making it possible for uh, introduction of hydrogen in a safe way to, uh, to the facility itself. And they also helped us to come up with some rough site screening criteria um, uh, in terms of uh, looking into the existing um, portfolio of the um, available storage facilities, looking at their age and the type of formation they are um, operating at, uh, depth, pressure, and all of that, and kind of prioritizing which, one, um, which ones are more um, uh, appropriate for uh, coming first uh, for piloting uh, and introducing hydrogen. Uh, the next project that we kicked off towards the end of last year, uh, so this is a two-year project. It's focused on storage of pure uh, hydrogen in aquifers. Um, this project is uh, funded by Department of Transportation, uh, FEMSA. FEMSA is Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, and they are basically uh, the organization that provide most of the regulations for um, pipeline delivery and you know, storage systems uh, in the U.S. So in this project, uh, we are working with a, a few members of our OTD, um, uh, OTD basically the operators uh, who own aquifer storage. They are going to provide samples to us. Um, the samples will be used in the lab for running the fundamental experimental uh, analysis that other colleagues uh, covered uh, so far. 
we will we, we'll be looking at the you know dispersion parameters for hydrogen solubility of hydrogen in the brine and uh, coming up with the you know relative permeability hard data that we can use for our uh, dynamic reservoir modeling in the reservoir modeling uh, we are uh, looking at fine tuning the model with the experimental data and then running it for um, longer periods of uh, uh, storage and uh, withdrawal. Basically what uh, we have seen so far in terms of the modeling is mostly uh, a few weeks. We want to expand that to a few months and see um, how much of hydrogen we will be able to recover. And really the end goal of this project is to help FEMSA uh, with uh, kind of re-evaluating the existing uh, standards for the natural gas storage and see uh, which parts need to be improved um, or um, uh, basically uh, change for uh, hydrogen compared to the natural gas. And uh, mm, th basically the, the goal is not to um, introduce a new set of standards, but basically use what we have currently for the natural gas and enhance it and build upon it uh, to make it more suitable for, for hydrogen or hydrogen blend storage. Um, the next project, we. Uh, this one just got awarded a few weeks ago, and since it hasn't been publicly announced, uh, I'm not allowed to share who the sponsors are. Uh, but um, uh, of course, I'm really excited about it, and I want to share uh, you know, the overall scope of the project. So this one is looking at a storage of pure hydrogen in depleted fields. Um, we have, an in, uh, we have a, a couple of industry partners in the south central region of the U.S. They are going to provide data and information about their fields. They have uh, depleted uh, gas fields that uh, they are considering for um, potentially hydrogen service. Uh, and again, uh, we will start by, fun by doing the fundamental experimental studies. Uh, the uh, experiments are um, you know, conducted at national labs, uh, so we are not uh, running the experiment in-house. We are partnering with the national labs. They are running most of the fundamental studies. And it includes flow-through experiments as well as um, um, biogeochemical reactions evaluation, basically looking at how hydrogen can uh, react with the uh, in-situ uh, microbial community as well as how it can impact the mineralogy of the um, subsurface formation. Uh, and another big part of this project will be around the techno-economic analysis and market assessment. Basically, we are going to run scenarios to see um, the changes in the future in the market of hydrogen demand and supply within that region, uh, how it uh, dictates the storage needs and how we can design and facilitate um, uh, the acceleration of deployment of storage uh, facilities who can meet uh, that demand in the, uh, in the long run. In terms of the leak detection for the underground uh, hydrogen storage, as um, you, you are aware, there are limited studies available. Uh, for obvious reasons, we don't have enough operating um, underground storage wells uh, to have enough data from them. And a key challenge for most of the commercially available hydrogen sensors is um, the placement of them in the underground environment. They have, uh, most of them have uh, sensitivities uh, to the temperature, pressure, and humidity. Uh, so um, one of the big challenges is to uh, basically um, modify these sensors for um, operating in the subsurface environment. There aren't, as I said, there aren't any studies published on the uh, underground leaks, but uh, there are some studies on the high pressure transmission pipeline and how hydrogen leaks happen in those pipelines. And basically these studies show that um, very close to the leak source, the concentration of hydrogen is higher, mainly because hydrogen uh, dissipates faster than methane. Um, but um, within some uh, distance, then you get the same composition as you had originally in your pipeline. For example, if you had 20% hydro um, hydrogen, 80% methane in your pipeline, close to the leak point, you may see 50% hydrogen. But as you move a bit further away, the mixing uh, is uh, the exact same composition that you had in the pipeline. Another findings from these studies is that um, there is a significant difference between um, um, the subsurface and surface behavior, flow behavior of hydrogen, uh, which uh, brings me to uh, the next topic uh, around um, basically developing and establishing the, uh, these leak uh, detection uh, technologies, uh, starting from the surface. 
So for this one, uh, we looked into some of our existing demonstration projects, and the idea was to basically use one of these sites that are producing and utilizing hydrogen uh, as a demo for um, deployment of the sensors and collecting as much data as we can um, in order to improve our uh, understanding of what needs to be done or changed in the future for the subsurface application of those sensors. And a big part of this project was um, to build uh, basically digital, uh, a digital twin of uh, you know, those plants because um, we don't want to like run multiple installments of the sensors on the plant, collect the data, go back and um, rearrange everything. So we basically uh, make a digital twin of the facility and run all of those potential scenarios in a digital space in, instead of a physical space. Um, and since a digital twin can mean a lot of things, I wanted to clarify that what uh, I mean here is that for every physical equipment or object that's available on the plant, there is a virtual companion in the um, you know, virtual space, and what connects these two is the data we are collecting, uh, data from all of the sensors and detectors that we have uh, on the facility. And basically, this virtual space allows us to run hundreds of uh, simulation and basically under test out uh, how under different operational circumstances, you know, hydrogen leak can uh, change and uh, how we can optimize our sensor placement to capture all those leaks under different uh, operational conditions. So the uh, demonstration site for this project is uh, H2 at a scale. This one, this one is developed under a Department of Energy um, call for uh, demonstration projects. Uh, the, the call was uh, also uh, named H2 at a scale, so you may have heard of it. Uh, the site is located, physically located in Austin, Texas, and it has been intentionally designed to act as a small hydrogen hub, and that's why we call it a proto hub, uh, because it has the hydrogen production, you know, storage, and end use application all in one place. On the production side, we have two SMR units uh, on this plant. They are using the renewable natural gas landfill gas for uh, producing 100 kilogram of hydrogen per day. There is also an electrolyzer on site producing about 40 kilograms of hydrogen per day. And on the end use application, uh, the data center of the uh, UT Austin campus um, has a 100 kilowatt fuel cell. And basically part of this hydrogen is used for powering that data center. And the rest of it is used for two main applications. And there is one refueling station for Toyota Mirai um, hydrogen fuel cell car. And we recently added another one for hydrogen powered drones. Um, these are uh, basically the um, end use applications for that hydrogen. And any excess hydrogen will be stored on the surface tanks. Um, given the um, um, basically the scale of production and demand for this one, um, uh, only a couple of storage tanks were enough to uh, you know, make sure we have enough uh, buffer available for the hydrogen. Now on the uh, leak detection program for um, H2 at the scale, we uh, partnered with several other organizations under a, co a cooperative R&D agreement called uh, CREDA, which basically brings um, different agencies and private sector together for enhancing technologies in one specific area. For this one, uh, NREL National Renewable Energy Laboratory is leading the work around uh, sensor development. The program is called Smart Hydrogen Wide Area Monitoring. NREL is basically going to receive uh, most of the sensors from the technology developers. There are multiple technology developers who are providing sensors to NREL. NREL takes them to the lab and tests these sensors, evaluates them, and, um, and ba basically come up with an evaluation of how these sensors uh, are performing and what are the criteria if we want to utilize them for uh, field deployment. Another um, component is around uh, um, the dispersion modeling. Uh, so again, NREL is leading that work, and they have um, a computational model for uh, basically building different scenarios of hydrogen leak and how uh, hydrogen dissipates uh, you know, from the leak source uh, within um, a specific distance from that leak, uh, leak source. Uh, another partner of the project is uh, EPRI. EPRI is mainly focused on uh, providing safety guidelines. So once we have the sensors and uh, we deploy them in the field, what are the safety uh, considerations for um, um, 
basically maintenance of the um, yeah, sensors as well as making sure they are not posing any um, hazard uh, in, in the area. Um, our role, GTI Energy's role, is building the digital twin and uh, coupling that with that flow um, uh, dispersion model in order to run multiple scenarios. And um, really the end goal here is to um, inform uh, sensor placement um, into the facility. So after we have uh, the model available, uh, we will inform what type of sensors has to be placed where in order for us to be able to capture all of the leaks, you know, um, and under different operational condition. And it's not just operational condition, but also the environmental condition, like how wind direction can impact um, the, le um, the leakages we are seeing and how we can detect them optimally. Some of the technical considerations uh, or basically specifications that NREL um, is, is using for evaluating these sensors are listed here. Uh, basically, they are being tested for their um, accuracy and reliability. The sensors uh, must be able to um, um, show that they are not impacted by, um, if they are traditionally gas sensors, they uh, must be tested and show that they are not impacted uh, by uh, hydrogen, by the presence of hydrogen. If they are hydrogen sensors, then they have to be tested for the selectivity and sensitivity, how much of hydrogen concentration they can detect, and what's, uh, what is their uh, minimum detection limit. And as I said, uh, they have to uh, meet the hazardous location certification to make sure they are uh, applicable and deployable in the field. And uh, last but not least, uh, we need to be mindful of their power consumption. Some of the sensor technologies require, uh, require high power, which limits their application um, to a large extent. And the technologies we are going to test, and uh, I'm not going into much details about this, uh, but basically we are looking at the Sherlin and uh, imaging system. It, basically an, it is basically an optical technique um, to help us um, find how different molecules are flowing um, in uh, different locations of the system. Uh, the hydrogen-specific ones are under development. They are still being developed in the lab and um, haven't been deployed commercially, uh, but they have high precision uh, for other applications. Uh, another one is the fiber optic sensing. Uh, fiber optic basically works based, um, based on the uh, fact that um, you know, the light transmission uh, inside the fiber is impacted by any external uh, stimuli. For example, any changes in pressure, in a strain, uh, it changes the light transmission and based on that we can uh, detect um, if any leak has happened. Uh, fiber optic has many applications. It has been previously used for a lot of subsurface applications, so it might be a good candidate for uh, UHS applications as well. Acoustic and ultrasonics are uh, working based on uh, detecting the uh, um, sound waves, and, and again, they have been uh, traditionally used for a lot of applications. They have had applications in the oil and gas industry as well, and potentially could be uh, utilized for underground um, purposes. The only challenge with that is uh, the sound dissipates quickly, so there is a certain um, uh, distance that you can detect uh, the leaks from. Uh, and finally, uh, Raman and LADAR, they are two different techniques, but both of them are using uh, laser beam and uh, based on the, um, uh, you know, LADAR based on the, the distance that it takes for the laser beam uh, to be scattered, uh, to be reflected back um, and finds the amount of the leakage from one location and can create the uh, 3D surface maps for the leaks you are uh, seeing in one area. And Raman is basically working based on the uh, principle of uh, Raman uh, scattering, basically the light that's reflected back from the molecule carries information about the molecule type based on the vibration. And uh, yeah, so in summary, most of these are in um, kind of in the research and development phase. There is a lot more testing that's required for these technologies to get to the maturity level uh, from that we feel comfortable with uh, placing and deploying them into the field. Uh, and out of all of these applications, and all of these sensors, uh, ROM and LADAR and fiber optics are the most promising one, uh, potentially for the UHS. We just need uh, more research uh, on these ones. And finally, uh, on conclusion, uh, basically th the building blocks for hydrogen leak detection are there in terms of the technologies that we have available to us. And while we don't have one single technology that can 
solve all of the problems and detect all of the leaks, we can come up with customized solutions. And um, the key to that is uh, more collaboration, more research, and uh, more testing of these uh, different technologies. So that's all I had. Thank you. Yes, so we have room for a few questions and then Hi, Claudio Filomena from Shell. Uh, thank you very much for this um, comprehensive overview, what you're currently doing on the uh, monitoring technologies. Um, on the um, fiber optics, um, so uh, are you planning to uh, deploy them uh, in a facility and, and deploy the fiber, uh, deploy the fiber along um, pipes, or um, did you think about wells as well? Uh, how, how would this, uh, this setup uh, look like? Sure, that's a great question, and uh, we are not testing the sensors ourselves and uh, NETL uh, and NREL, National uh, Energy Renewable Laboratory, are testing the sensors. Uh, they have basically passed a couple of tests inside the pipeline over a short distance, so the next stage for that is to deploy the sensors for high-pressure transmission pipelines over a few miles and uh, to see uh, basically how the sensors perform. And it's only after that that we can decide whether we can place it in a well, downhole well, uh, for hydrogen detection or not. And one concern about that that uh, some of the operators have is that whether the uh, fiber optic itself, the cable itself, can uh, create a conduit for a leak. <laughs> so <laughs> and that's also something we need to understand better. Thank you. More questions? So there are some sites already to be studied for underground hydrogen storage. Is, uh, so uh, ha what's the perspective in the U.S. for production of green hydrogen and bringing also porous media? Uh, there was our note comment yesterday that it looks like in U.S. we do more commercial scale uh, uh, deployment. And here in Europe, you're doing a lot of pilot, pilot, pilot testing with fewer commercial. So I suspect that um, you are referring to the hydrogen hubs. Yes. So the call for the hydrogen hub specifically asked for all the technologies to be in commercial scale just because they didn't want to allocate federal funding to you know, fundamental research studies. But there are um, those fundamental research studies ongoing you know, under different calls, um, mm -hmm. even from the Department of oh, Energy that, that itself. That specific call is more... That specific call is focused on the commercial application. Okay, thank you very much. So Shadi will be here for the next day or so, so we can discuss with her more. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.